Warning, this episode contains accounts of murder and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Dance halls were one of the most prominent features of post-war Britain and Glasgow's reigned supreme. Glasgow's first dance hall, the Albert Ballroom on Bath Street, opened in 1905. By 1920, a solid dozen venues welcomed the movers and shakers of the city. World War II interrupted much of the dance hall culture, but after it ended, the venues hit new heights. With the men and women of the time recovering from the atrocities of war, it felt good to get your best clothes on and go out and socialise and dance to the music of the time. It didn't hurt business that it was one of the few socially acceptable areas for unwed men and women to mix too. In Glasgow, one venue reigned supreme, the Barrowland Ballroom. Initially known as the Barrowland's Palace to Dance, the venue was pitched up by a local woman colloquially referred to as the Barra's Queen and known on her birth certificate as Maggie McIver. She had created the large market surrounding where the venue was now sat and keen to keep punters in her pocket, rather than that of competitors, she brought entertainment too. In the Mammoth Hall, feet were tapped to the music provided by house band Billy McGregor and the Gaybirds. The venue itself had two distinct phases. It had initially been erected in 1934 with a famous eight foot sign over the door of a man pushing a barrow, a nod to the history of the area which is to this day a famous barrow based out and indoor market. The venue tragically burned down in August of 1958, shortly after Maggie's death. However, the new owners were resilient. From the melted and bent girders, shattered concrete and debris rose the most impressive dance hall the city had seen. The soon-to-be famous Barrowland illuminating sign which they installed in 1960 ran the entire length of the front of the building and its luminescent glow would light up the entire street on a dark night. As the new building neared completion and the 40 foot high illumination flickered its neon glow for the first time into the night sky of Glasgow's East End, anticipation grew for opening night. Flyers were distributed, excited words were exchanged in pubs, and soon everybody knew Christmas Eve 1960 was to be the dawn of a new era for the Barrowlands Ballroom. Over the next couple of years, the rejuvenated Barrowlands did a roaring trade, even though around it many of its competitors were beginning to struggle. Varyingly, as the flowing dresses and wingtip shoes stopped gracing their dance floors, the closing venues blamed the decline on the rise of intergender mingling in other social circumstances, individualism, or even the acquisition of personal TV sets. Whatever the case, only the strong and pliable were surviving and concessions had to be made. No longer was the Barrowlands the place where you had to wear your best suit and show up sober as the proverbial judge to ensure you would get in. People were beginning to dress more casually and a couple of drinks in nearby pubs were completely acceptable. In previous generations, the ballrooms did not allow patrons to drink before attending and steadfastly never permitted the sale of alcohol inside, no matter how far they softened the stands in other areas. Having been the most liberal in its loosening of the rules, there was some noticeable effect on how people perceived the Barrowlands as the late 1960s approached. Some other dance halls managed to stay open, despite their more rigid approach to the so-called old way, such as the majestic ballroom in the city centre, and were considered a more upmarket choice as a result. One of the most salacious aspects of the Barrowlands existence in the late 1960s were the dances held on Thursday nights, which were open to those over 25. Ian Dunbar, a Strathclyde police officer of 30 years service, later reflected on Thursdays at the Barrowlands as such, quote, 
They were like Sodom and Gomorrah, married men and women on the pool. You had to see it to believe it. It is widely reported that on the night of such events, the keen observer would be able to spot men and women in the queue for the Barrowlands, subtly removing wedding rings from their fingers and practicing their new name for the evening as they stood patiently awaiting entry to the venue. On Thursday, February 22, 1968, Patricia Docker was one such attendee. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker. Patricia was petite in stature, as most Glasgow women of the time were, given the long-term effects of World War II rationing. She had an attractive face and was known to be incredibly kind. She was not often an attendee at the Glasgow dance halls of the time, as she had not long returned to Glasgow and had little spare time. Patricia had lived on base in RAF Digby in England with her husband, Corporal Alex Docker, who was serving in the Royal Air Force. The pair then moved to Cyprus, again with the army. Struggling with the stresses of life on base, raising their young son Sandy, and being an army wife, the pair's private life suffered. Eventually, they agreed to split, and Patricia returned from Cyprus to live with her parents in the south side of Glasgow in May of 1967, along with her young son Sandy. Alex returned to RAF Digby, Her parents adored her, describing her as, quote, an angel. She had picked up employment as a nurse at a nearby hospital, Mernskirk Hospital, on the outskirts of Glasgow, and between her tough working schedule, raising a young child, and trying to cram in enough sleep to make it all possible, she often went without any social life to speak of. It's quite easy to see the appeal of a night of carefree dancing, and perhaps a few drinks before going, when considering the trials and tribulations of being a single mother, working difficult shift patterns, and raising her child in her parents' spare room. Patricia informed her parents that some of her work colleagues intended to go to the majestic ballroom. Her parents offered her the opportunity to let her hair down by watching their little grandson, so that she could enjoy a night on the town with her colleagues. Patricia delightfully accepted their offer and on Thursday, February 22nd, she styled her hair, squeezed into the yellow dress she had selected for the occasion, donned her coat and bag and set off to meet with her colleagues to enjoy an evening's dancing. She met up with them and at some point she separated off and headed to the Barrowlands. Once there, she danced with a red-headed man and left sometime before the final dance bell tolled at 11.30pm. Morris Goodman, a joiner who lived local to Patricia's parents in Langside, in Glasgow's south side, got up for work the following morning of February 23rd and began his travel to work at around 7.30am. He knew a shortcut down Carmichael Place, a side street in Langside, which he took every morning. As he jutted down, trying to shave a few minutes from his morning commute, he spied something which unsettled him. It looked like something he and countless other early rising Glaswegians had seen before. A drunken man who had fallen asleep at one end of the alleyway. But drunken men weren't usually naked and very few people could sleep in such an odd position. Perturbed, he edged closer to the figure It was then that he realised two things. This was no drunken man, and this person wasn't sleeping. They were dead. Morris quickly returned home and phoned the police to alert them to the discovery. What the police discovered made for grim reading. The victim had been positioned post-mortem, with her head to the right-hand side. Her clothing had been removed and there were identifiable marks which strongly suggested she had been strangled. It also seemed likely she had been sexually assaulted. Her clothing had been taken after being removed 
and her belongings were also taken. The victim had been menstruating at the time of her death and her sanitary towel had been discarded in close vicinity to the crime scene. Despite the limitations in forensic at the time, solid detective work was able to establish that the victim had been murdered a number of hours before in another location and she had been brought to Carmichael Place to be displayed or disposed of. Door-to-door inquiries resulted in one nearby household stating they had perhaps heard cries of quote, leave me alone, but they couldn't be certain. Two local nurses attended the morgue, however, as they were unable to identify the woman, the evening papers ran a story of the discovery. No worried significant others, parents or friends came forward to note an absence. Patricia's father, John Wilson, had noted the story with a flutter in his stomach arising from the fact she had not come home from her night of dancing. He shrugged it off, content in the belief his daughter would reappear and was likely simply staying with a friend and had forgotten to make contact. When he awoke the following day and she was nowhere to be seen, panic took hold. He took her photo to the local police station. The looks on the faces of the men on the other side of the glass likely told him all he needed to know. He was then taken to formally identify the body in the morgue. The unknown victim on Carmichael Place was no longer a Jane Doe. She was Patricia Docker of Langside Place in Glasgow. The police urgently stepped up their search in the immediate area. Patricia's bag was discovered, having been dumped within the waters of the River Cart, a small tributary of Glasgow's main river, the River Clyde, which runs through the south side of the city. The discovery of Patricia's handbag in the River Cart was marked as significant, as being a quiet moving stretch of water only one kilometre long and not easily visible from the main roads it was significantly more likely that a local of the south side would be aware of its existence than someone from outside of the area. The water itself had damaged much of the evidence which could have been garnered from the bag. The remainder of Patricia's missing belongings were not discovered. When interviewing Patricia's parents, they recounted Patricia's evening as they had it described to them. She was going to the majestic ballroom to enjoy an evening's dancing with some friends from work, then come home. They were unaware she had ended her evening in the Barrowland ballroom, so were unable to pass this key piece of evidence on to the police. Given that spouses are always key persons of interest, the Criminal Investigation Division quickly sought out Alex Docker. However, he had a watertight alibi at RAF Digby, having been on base at the time in an entirely separate country. In light of this, the investigation proceeded in earnest. Interviewing dozens of attendees of the majestic ballroom in the city centre and asking the same significant question. Did they see a petite lady with brown hair wearing a yellow dress leaving the majestic ballroom? The main problem which the police were unable to foresee at this point was that they were asking the right question in the entirely wrong section of the city. As the days passed, memories became hazy. By the time that the police had established they were currently taking statements from attendees at the wrong ballroom and refocused their investigation on the Barrowlands, it was three weeks after the crime had taken place. A further significant blocker the investigation encountered was that the Barrowlands over 25's casual hookup culture meant that many of the attendees were reticent to come forward for fear of displeasing their partners or spouses. Some would have said they were elsewhere on the evening and a day in court admitting to their infidelity or lies seemed worse to them than simply keeping quiet. As the months drew on and no results were obtained, the dancers took once again to the ballroom floor and the would-be Casanovas once more slipped off their rings on unspoken Thursday nights. Patricia's family, however, just like others soon to follow, were to have no such return to happiness. 
Jemima MacDonald hailed from the east end of Glasgow. She, at 33 years of age, had resisted the allure of marriage, unlike many of the women of her time. She had birthed three children, Elizabeth, Andrew and Alan, and they were enough for her. People might have spoken, but she didn't particularly care. She could be happy by herself, and that was what mattered. Living across the landing in her block of flats was her sister, Margaret, and her partner. It was handy. Jemima liked to dance and was a known fun seeker. She had to sideline her love of dancing most of the time to look after her kids, but whenever Margaret had an evening free, she would take Jemima's children for her to let her go and dance. Jemima had been taking full advantage of Margaret's free schedule, having went out two nights in a row and approached her, angling for her to take care of the children one more time, allowing her a third of dancing on Saturday, August 16, 1969. It had been a full 18 months since the murder of Patricia Docker and the dance floors had returned to their enchanting best and Jemima didn't want to miss a beat. She went alone to the events, happy to strike up a conversation with a potential dance partner on the night. Margaret relented, so Jemima donned her black dress and set off for the Barrowlands Ballroom, making a quick detour into a bar en route Inside the bar, she struck up a conversation with a well-heeled gentleman, tall with red hair. She then proceeded to the ballroom, whereby again, numerous patrons observed her dancing with a man of a similar description, and presumably the same man as the previous venue. The fact that the pair were so vividly recalled may seem unlikely, however the gentleman in question stood out for several reasons. Men in Glasgow in 1969 typically wore their hair longer, with sideburns down the side of their face. This man had his hair cropped short. Similarly, Wales Glasgow undeniably has a larger proportion of redheads than most areas of the world. They are still less common than other hair colours. Potentially, their gaze was drawn to his closely cropped hair due to its coloration. He also wore a fine suit, which one patron noted as having a particularly fine lapel. This was once again set against the majority of the Barrowlands male clientele, dressed in trousers and jumpers with blazers. The pair departed shortly before closing time, and wandered a circuitous route around the East End, whereby they likely ended up near or at Jemima's flat. Margaret had long since set Jemima's three children to bed as the newly met pair stumbled up McKee Street in Calton, Glasgow. The following morning, Margaret got up and fed Jemima's kids. She knew it wouldn't be first thing in the morning when Jemima arrived at her door, but it would be early enough. And if she wasn't on time, Margaret resolved just to cross the landing and chap her door until she awoke. As morning turned to early afternoon, Margaret had some worrying thoughts. To ease her mind, she went to Jemima's door and began to chat loudly. Getting no reply and seeing no lights on within the house did little to settle her ill feeling. As evening came, Margaret accepted she was simply to look after Jemima's children and deal with the fallout later. She also had to go and get extra food for the free house guests, now on their fourth dinner at her house. Margaret went to the shops to get the extra groceries, hoping the short trip would help take her mind off her worries over Jemima. The situation had the complete opposite effect when she heard some local children discussing a body lying in a nearby disused and dilapidated tenement building. The building was supposed to be vacant, however, Due to access local children had created to get up to minor mischief, it had become a broken down sanctuary for drug users, prostitutes and alcoholics. Keen to avoid the weather of a Glasgow autumn night, Margaret put the worries out of her head and resolved should she not hear from Jemima the following morning, she would follow up on what she had heard. Dawn broke. 
breakfast was had and still, Margaret heard nothing from Jemima. Her ill feelings from the previous day arose. She quickly donned her outerwear and steeled her stomach to confront whatever lay in the ominous tenement, no matter how dangerous its inhabitants. She need not have worried for her safety, as the tenement was packed with locals who had also heard the news. One local pointed her to a body prostrate on the ground. Another local turned the body so they could see the face of the victim. They were content they never knew them and turned to walk away. Whilst the local who had turned the body over did not know the victim, Margaret did. The look on her face would have said everything anyone would need to know. That look of grief could only mean one thing. Jemima MacDonald Her beloved sister was the woman who lay dead on the floor of the dingy tenement before her and her three newly orphaned children were sitting none the wiser awaiting dinner in Margaret's flat. The police soon swarmed the area to investigate. What the investigators discovered was that just as Patricia Docker had been, Jemima had been strangled to death and had been the victim of a rape prior to her death. Unlike Patricia, the offender had committed extreme physical violence against Jemima prior to her death. Her headscarf and bag had been stolen. The remainder of her clothing was still on her body in various states of disarray, either torn, frayed or removed. Jemima too had been menstruating and again a sanitary pad was found nearby to her body. The investigators quickly pieced together where Jemima had spent the previous evening from her sister's testimony. Together with the venue's proprietors, they arranged to project Jemima's face onto the walls of the Barrowland Ballroom when it was at its most full on a Saturday evening, along with a statement encouraging anyone who recognised her face to come forward to the police. Whilst treating the cases officially from the standpoint of being individual incidents and having independent lines on inquiry, the investigators were keenly aware of some of the issues which had plagued the investigation into the murder of Patricia Docker. Keen to avoid a repeat failure, they took what was then an unprecedented step in Scotland and promised to seal any and all statements to ensure anonymity to anyone who may come forward. This meant that the police could get a broader picture of the night in question and for their help, men and women who were up to something they shouldn't have been that evening wouldn't lose their relationships, home or reputation as a result. They also attended the venue undercover themselves every week, dancing on the famous floor, hoping their attendance would lead to a breakthrough. One female police officer even helped create a reconstruction which was widely circulated in newspapers, wearing similar attire to what Jemima wore on the 16th of August and had Jemima's face superimposed over hers to try and jog as many memories as possible. This multi-pronged approach appeared to work. Two independent witnesses, safe in the knowledge their identities would not be revealed, came forward and noted that they had seen Jemima leaving the Barrowland with a man. They described him as tall and good looking, young, somewhere between 25 and 35, with reddish hair cut short. He was wearing a suit and tie, a fact remembered once again due to dressing this smart having stood out against the typical clientele within the ballroom. The police were not oblivious to the similarities with the description of the man whom Patricia Docker had left the Barrowlands with nearly 18 months prior. Jemima and her dance partner appeared to be getting along well and left together around midnight. Some further witnesses then placed the pair walking through the East End, allowing police to decide that Jemima had willingly walked towards McKeith Street with her murderer on that evening. These new leads did not lead to any arrests. As the 10th day of the investigation approached, the investigatory team decided to push harder on the public assistance angle. 
With the aim of assisting the public to assist the police, they sought the help of a Glasgow School of Art professor, George Lennox Patterson, to create an identification image based on eyewitness descriptions from the evening. With the image hastily composed, a somewhat unprecedented move for the time was taken, with the identification image spread across the front of Scottish newspapers. The image created uproar. It was the topic of every workplace tea room, every family dinner table, and nearly every spare media column inch. With the suspect's face set in near profile, the deep grey-blue eyes of the image follow the image's viewer. The lips are set in a sneer, seeming almost taunting, or knowing something the viewer does not. The nose is slim and sharp, and the neat, stiff collars of a white shirt are separated only by the knot of a blue tie. The red hair and eyebrows are the deep burnished orange, common only to Scots, and the man's short hair is parted neatly on the left side. If it were not for the sinister intentions of the offender which the viewer imparts to the image, it could be the image of a salesman, a minister or an accountant. The generality of the image has been one of the key criticisms, given that it lacked significant detail in the aspects of the image from which the public could have drawn conclusions around his identity. It was later described as being more of an artwork inspired by the descriptions rather than an accurate portrayal of what was being described. Unsurprisingly, the image did not lead to any significant breakthroughs in the case. It appeared the trail for the tall red-headed man who had twice hunted female attendees of the Barrowland Ballroom was once again about to go cold. Helen Puttock was a proud 29-year-old Glaswegian living at 129 Errol Street. Scotston, in Glasgow's West End, with her mother and two children. With the West End being the most affluent quadrant of the city, she lived a decent life for the time. Helen was slim, standing five feet six inches tall, with dark hair cut into a short bob. She was married to George Puttock, an army man from Berkshire in England. He was still on post. However, Helen couldn't stomach life in the barracks any longer, which is why she was back in Glasgow, in her mother's house. George had some upcoming leave on the 30th of October and informed Helen of this by letter, excited at finally seeing his wife and children to unwind after long months of army governance. To his surprise, Helen informed him that she had agreed to go dancing that evening with her sister, Jeannie. This caused a bit of strife between the pair, however, by the time George was in Scotston with Helen and the children, he had relented. He gave Helen some extra money, noting she should get a taxi home after it for her safety. It had been little over ten weeks since Jemima MacDonald's death, and whilst Glasgow was finally beginning to breathe a bit easier, there was still an awareness of the devil in their midst. Helen brushed off George's concern. She noted to him that she was going with Jeannie and they would be alright in a pair. It was true, after all, that both previous victims of the murderous spectre of the Barrowland Ballroom had attended the venue by themselves. Helen and Jeannie met up at Helen's flat and got ready for their night of dancing as George looked after the children. The pair then headed out, dropping into a local pub and had a few drinks. Feeling merry, the pair headed over to the queue for the ballroom. Once inside, a man quickly began to show attention towards Jeannie. He introduced himself as John from Castle Milk in the city's south side and the pair quickly split off to dance. Helen stood adrift, looking on at the dancing revellers when she briefly spotted a red-haired man at her right-hand side. He then seemed to double back and appeared at her left-hand side, bumping into Helen in the process. The man apologised for his transgression 
and mentioned to Helen that his name was John, just as the man who had branched off with Jeannie had been. She introduced herself in kind. The pair quickly developed a rapport, with Helen noting the man's smart appearance and upmarket accent. Once Jeannie and her dance partner had reunited with Helen and this new man John, he displayed gentlemanly tendencies to the group. He was very understanding and done his best to make the ladies of the group feel welcome. The sweet edge to the new John slipped somewhat when Jeannie had attempted to use a faulty cigarette machine within the establishment. The machine swallowed her money but did not dispense her requested cigarettes. He flew off in a rage at nearby employees of the Barrowland, demanding her money be refunded or the cigarettes provided. According to Jeannie, he became very brooding and had an air of authority which meant that, unlike most revellers who caused a scene in the venue, he was not removed from the establishment for the way in which he was behaving. Eventually, the music ended, the lights dimmed and the group left the ballroom of their own accord. Jeannie was accompanied by Castle Milk John and Helen walked with the new red-haired John. As they walked down the street, Jeannie's partner seemed to have a change of heart and bid his farewells to his dance partner without an evening kiss. The group seen him quickly walking off to a nearby bus stop. The remaining trio then went off in search of a taxi. On the journey to the taxi rank, and in the taxi itself, John began to open up about his upbringing. He spoke at length about his religious upbringing, repeatedly making references to the Bible in his speech. He had earlier referred to his father's views of the city's dance halls as dens of iniquity during the walk to the taxi, and then recounted what seemed to be an Old Testament story about an adulterous woman being stoned. Jeannie asked in an attempt to lighten the mood how he typically brought in New Year, whereby he noted, I don't drink at Hogmanay, I pray. Hogmanay is a Scots celebration of the New Year, typically brought in with much festivity, partying and drinking. The chat then progressed to the more obvious social conversation, such as golf, and Helen's John mentioned a cousin had once sunk a hole in one. Despite some of the odd intrusions the man's demeanour presented, both women in the taxi were impressed by him. He seemed charming, decent and well-to-do, if a little odd in some of his mannerisms. When John mentioned to Jeannie that she was free to get dropped off first at her house in Yoker and that she would see Helen home safe back to Scotston, which was around a two-mile trip, he said he would then finish the taxi ride home by himself ensuring none of the women were left at risk in a taxi by themselves with a stranger. It seemed in fitting with his gentlemanly graces he had displayed throughout the night. Jeannie bid the pair good night at the threshold of her door, their goodbyes filtering back to her through the taxi window, and soon after, she drifted off to sleep. Early the following morning of October 31, 1969, Archie McIntyre, a local man who lived at 95 L Street took his small dog, Smokey, out to a communal area behind his house to urinate at around 7.30am. His dog was attracted to something which lay on the ground and would not come when called. As Mr McIntyre approached what interested his dog on the ground, he thought it to be a bundle of rags. He quickly realised it was a woman, a dead woman and one who had sustained significant violence before passing. Lacking a phone to make the alert, he ran to the house of a neighbour who did and dialed for the police. Once they arrived, the scene was made secure. Barring the activities of Mr McIntyre's dog, the crime scene was almost entirely preserved and they intended to keep it that way. Whilst forensic science techniques were nowhere near as sophisticated as they are today, the killer had left some significant clues for the investigators to work with. The offender had bitten his victim, leaving a deep gouge and mouth impression. The cause of death was asphyxiation and she had been strangled with her own nylon tights. 
there was semen on her clothing, which again was varying torn and frayed. Her black dress and ocelot fur coat were pulled up over her head. Again, the victim had been menstruating and a sanitary pad was found at the scene of the crime. This time, the offender had added a flair to his presentation of the victim. He had placed her used sanitary pad under her right arm rather than simply discarding it as had been the case at previous crime scenes. Interestingly for the time, the semen sample from the clothing was stored by the investigation team. Superintendent Joe Beatty and DCS Elphinstone de Gleish were then given complete command over the investigation, setting up an investigation office which was described somewhat macabrely as a murder caravan in one local paper. It did not take long for their team to identify the victim. Word spread fast on the street in those days and George Puttock, sick with worry over his wife's failure to reappear the previous evening, attended the makeshift investigation office nearby to the crime scene. Having approached an officer, George described his wife's clothing from the previous night. He was informed then and there that the woman dead, lying only metres from their home on the very same street, was his wife, Helen Puttock. One point of interest was that George described her handbag, yet no handbag was ever recovered from the crime scene or thereafter. Patricia Docker and Jemima MacDonald also had their handbags taken at the scene of the crime, although Patricia's was found discarded afterwards. The police quickly interviewed Jeannie, given she had spent what was Helen's last ever evening on earth with her. She was their best chance at a solid lead. They were given an immediate boost to their hopes of finding her killer, when Jeannie was able to explain that not only did she see the man with whom Helen had danced with, she had spent an evening and a taxi ride home chatting with him. Jeannie's testimony tied in with numerous eyewitnesses in both the Patricia Docker and Jemima MacDonald cases. Jeannie had a few drinks that evening, but her recollection was nonetheless vivid. The man who had called himself John was well-heeled, tall and red-headed. She had managed to give some further information as she had noticed red-headed John had a tooth missing and several of those he did have overlapped in some fashion. He regularly fidgeted with a metal pin attached to his lapel and smoked embassy cigarettes. Jeannie was also certain in her testimony that he had mentioned his surname at one point which she believed to be Templeton or Sempelson or something of that ilk. It was from Jeannie that the police were able to find out about the supplemental information about the man using biblical references and having a golfing cousin. Jeannie mentioned that she wasn't sure if John was his real name. It was, after all, Thursday night at the Barrowland Ballroom. Most of the names of the men who graced the boards that evening were true for one night only. Jeannie had the identifit drawn up by George Lennox Patterson in the aftermath of Jemima's murder shown to her. And despite some small differences she could pick out and the generic look of the image, she apparently stated, quote, Aye, that's him. Nay bother, that will get him. Some of the bouncers, however, who had noticed the man leaving with Helen Puttock, later disputed some of the aspects of the description given alongside the image noting the man they remembered was slightly smaller and had more of a brownish tinge to his hair colour. The image was nonetheless updated to reflect the differences which Jeannie noted and was widely circulated in all popular media forms. To accompany the image, the newspaperman wanted a snappy title. Apocryphally, one famous Glaswegian columnist fought back to Jeannie's testimony on the man's supposed religious fervour as he telephoned the office to submit his copy one evening and simply noted to his printer's back on the floor, quote, Aye, and call him Bible John. Wherever the moniker arose from, Bible John took off like wildfire. The image, even more sinister in its second iteration, 
captivated the imagination of the public. Soon, everyone in Scotland knew or claimed to know the man in the picture. Thousands of tips came flooding into Superintendent Joe Beatty's action room. Every Glaswegian with an uncle who had displayed the slightest sign of sinister behaviour or an estranged father was certain that their family's black sheep was the man the police were searching for. Some shouted it from the rooftops and others muttered it only in solemn tones to other family members after a night of drinking. The likelihood of these supposed suspects being the offender were expectedly low. However, one key witness who had not been forthcoming amidst the furore was Jeannie's John, dubbed Castlemilk John due to the location he noted as his hometown. He had been the party's fourth member prior to heading for his bus. Jeannie remembered Castlemilk John had noted he was a labourer who attended night school and was able to describe his features well. Despite public appeals in the local media for him to come forward, both in 1969 and periodically thereafter, to this day, Castle Milk John has never come forward to assist any inquiry. By November 4, Helen Puttock's murder was no longer headline news. It was supplanted by news of a fire which had ravaged Scottish television's Glasgow studios. By November 5, Bible John was a mere column inch in the middle pages of the Evening Times. As the public appeal through the media dwindled to little result, the investigation into the surrounding circumstances, which the evidence could suggest continued. With certainty, the police could place the man's dental records to within a margin given the bite left on Helen Puttock. They could place his hairstyle and they could make some inferences into the quality of his suit and its tailoring. As such, over 400 tailors, a similar number of barbers and every dentist in the city was questioned. All of the men with overlapping front teeth on their dental records were brought in for questioning and all were eventually cleared. Unfortunately, despite the effort, this widespread approach held little benefit to the investigation. Men who resembled the photo fit were often simply stopped in the street and subjected to intense questioning within the police incident room to establish their whereabouts during the crimes. A team from the investigation department began to attend dances within the ballrooms of the city, undercover, whereby the public dubbed them Quote, the Bible John Formation Dancing Team. One member later remarked the venture did not enhance his investigation, but did however enable him to learn to samba. As they reached the bottom of the known list of facts around Bible John, the team surveyed local golf courses to create an interview list of any of their members who had scored a hole in one on the course. Again, the endeavour was fraught. The force's increasing desperation was shown when in 1970, around six months after the crime had taken place, they engaged with Gerard Quasset, a supposed psychic from the Netherlands, to attempt to garner new evidence. His findings led to no significant developments in the case. As 1970 began, the people of Glasgow moved on whilst the investigation stagnated. Joe Beatty took sole control over the case not long after the murder of Helen Puttock. He was a fine policeman, but one without luck. On the street, the case was still spoken of and intrigued and scared people in equal measure. Locals always had their suspicions. There was always someone they marked as being Bible John. They just couldn't prove it. So as month passed to month and year, into year, Bible John was linked to no further murders. They simply stopped, which even Ian Stephen, a forensic psychologist, noted to be particularly unusual. But stopped they were, gone like a shadow in the night. Bible John was thereafter confined to the role of Glasgow's very own unsolved boogeyman.
In the aftermath, the first real suspect the investigators pursued was a former soldier in the Scots Guard, John McInnes. McInnes was a deeply religious man from Stonehouse in Lanarkshire. He fit the profile of Bible John, was a known attendee of the Barrowlands Ballroom and bore a strong resemblance to the image which had been produced. As was common in those days, the police created a lineup and Jeannie was told to walk up and down, then identify any man in the lineup who she recognised as being the offender. It was an archaic and scary process, and more than one criminal escaped justice through the fright which many witnesses experienced as they paced the identification room's floor. Nonetheless, Jeannie was tough. She paced the room a number of times before declaring that no man in the room was the man with whom she had shared a taxi on October 30, 1969. John McInnes stood within the lineup. For Jeannie, he wasn't the man. For the police, they weren't so sure. John McInnes killed himself in the early 1980s. He had lived the remainder of his life under a cloud of suspicion from within his own village and within Strathclyde Police. Then, in 1983, there was a potential breakthrough. An unknown man made contact with the Strathclyde Police Department who had jurisdiction over the Bible John investigation. They had replaced the outgoing City of Glasgow Police back in 1975 and while some of the original criminal investigation division had come over to the new entity, many had left since the changeover. The man on the phone noted something the investigators found of particular interest. He was somewhat aware of the story of Bible John, given he attended the Barrowland Ballroom at the time, but had never actually seen the identifit which had been made of the suspect. Earlier that year, he had seen the image for the very first time, and he was certain he knew the man in question. Investigators were used to this kind of story. They got them periodically even still. However, this man seemed at least plausible. When he mentioned that he was so certain he had even hired a private investigator to track the man down, they realised they were either dealing with someone suffering from severe delusions or someone who truly believed they could offer a breakthrough in the case, and this man didn't sound delusional. The police met with the man who provided everything he knew about the potential suspect, including his location. Officers from the Strathclyde force went over to the Netherlands to interview the man, however nothing came from their investigation. Genuine the anonymous caller may have been, but he was also mistaken. The investigators were again back to square one, and Bible John's dusty case file was returned to the annals of Strathclyde Police's unsolved pile. The 1983 reinvestigation brought renewed hope to some of the team that they were close. By the mid-1990s, suspicion once again fell onto their initial suspect, John McInnes. With the advances made in medical and forensic science, their minds returned to the semen sample stored from the clothing of Helen Puttock. Despite his death nearly 13 years previously, Strathclyde Police approached a sibling of John McInnes and stated that they were looking to conduct a DNA analysis to conclusively remove him as a suspect. To try and restore their brother's reputation, this was accepted. The results provided no further answers for the investigators or at least none that they liked. The police then made an application to the High Court for an exhumation licence and for the right to perform a DNA extraction afterwards. Despite the somewhat flimsy basis on which the application was made, the order was granted. John McInnes' body was brought up from his grave in 1996 and subjected to a sample extraction for comparison with the known DNA of Helen Puttock's killer. Newspapers were informed by quote, inside sources that this was mere formality and the force would be able to clear the Bible John case off as soon as the results returned. 
John McInnes, now dubbed only Bible John, had his remaining family also prominently displayed within Scottish newspapers. The only hiccup in the eyes of the police was the length of time it was taking to return the results. Months were passing and there was no news. John McInnes's family were suffering the taunts of being the offspring of murderous scum. Only, he wasn't. Well, conclusively at least in the cases of Helen Puttock, Jemima MacDonald and Patricia Docker. When the DNA analysis was returned, John McInnes was cleared of all wrongdoing. His media show trial had declared him guilty from beyond the grave, but science had proven him innocent. A strange occurrence took place in 2004, when police obtained an 80% match to the Bible John DNA sample from the site of a minor crime two years earlier. The sample was close enough of a match to indicate it is somewhere between possible and likely that the offender was related to the Bible John killer. It seems unfortunate that this offender slipped through the police's net given the breakthroughs in forensic genealogy. If this party were to be identified, then with the correct planning out of their family tree and their distant relatives, the police may be able to identify suitable reference points to narrow the suspect list. Whether this has been revisited in light of forensic genealogy is unknown. A further suspect was put forward by psychologist Ian Stephen in the early 2000s. Professor Stephen is an expert in the psychological profiling of criminals. His real-life work inspired the Scottish investigative television series Cracker, which starred Robbie Coltrane, well known for his role in Harry Potter films as Hagrid. Stephen claims to have obtained a lead from a Scot living in the United States, who suspected that a family member may have been Bible John. The potential suspect was the son of a police officer who was raised by a church-going aunt. He lived in a village not far outside of Glasgow with his wife and two children at the time of the killings. Relatives claimed that he was then a keen dancer who frequented ballrooms. His behaviour was said to have changed at the time of the murders when he began going out alone at night and sometimes failed to return until the next day. He then moved his entire family to England in 1970, shortly after the death of Helen Puttock. Family sources say he was never questioned, although he did bear a likeness to the identified picture of the killer. Professor Stephen stated, quote, The profile appears to fit that of Bible John. While the information is circumstantial, I think the police have got to have a serious look at it. This avenue appears never to have been followed up. According to retired police officer and author Paul Harrison, a local police officer was under suspicion by the investigating officer in the Bible John case, Joe Beatty, but he was ordered to shut down that line of inquiry by higher bosses. Harrison believed he had uncovered the name of this officer and has offered this information to the police. In his book, Dancing with the Devil, The Bible John Murders, Harrison details his search for the truth about the identity of Bible John and he claims the killer was a serving police officer at the time of the murders. He claimed he knew the area this man now lives and is concerned he may have killed again. Paul Harrison had publicly declared that he was one of the first police officers in the UK to train with the FBI on criminal profiling techniques. This description, however, has now been cast into doubt by FBI agents who were involved at Quantico at the times which Harrison had mentioned. Harrison makes several claims within his book, including that Jeannie Williams was sure the man she met that night was a police officer. He also claims through interviews with people at the ballroom He has uncovered several witness statements which describe a man who had been involved in numerous altercations at the venue, showing a police warrant card in the aftermath. The man also fit the description of the so-called Bible John shown in the papers at the time. 
Harrison also states that his independent research has led him to a story that when DSI Beatty showed his warrant card to Jeannie, she declared it to be identical to the one which Bible John had shown to her sister. Similarly, the man whom Jeannie spent the night dancing with, Castle Milk John, told her he suspected red-headed John to be an undercover cop. He also stated a suspicion that Castle Milk John may have been one too. Harrison posited that this may be the reason why he elected to head back home that evening rather than get in their taxi. Even further, it could potentially have been the reason he never came forward in the aftermath. Harrison stated that when he interviewed Jeannie, she told him that when she attended Marine Police Station in Partick to look at suspects, she pointed a man of interest out, but was told that was impossible as he was one of DSI Beatty's detectives and to focus on the lineup they had created. None of Paul Harrison's findings or names have ever been made public. The biggest tangible breakthrough in the Bible John investigation came slowly from events in September of 2006. Peter Britton Tobin was born in Johnston, Renfrewshire, a small town which lies around 10 miles from Glasgow's city centre. In 2006, Tobin was a 60-year-old man working as a caretaker for St. Patrick's Church in Anderston, Glasgow. Employed by a local Catholic homeless support group, Loaves and Fishes, in return for lodgings. He was not, however, known as Peter Tobin. He had been going by the name Pat McLaughlin due to an existing arrest warrant for breaching his bail conditions in 2005. Alongside Pat in the presbytery was a fellow lodger, Angelica Kluck, a timid and kind 23-year-old Polish student who worked as a cleaner within the church itself. The two got on as any work colleagues do. They were friendly enough without being great friends. Tobin, for all he had a criminal past, was an entirely normal and friendly man on the surface and took pride in his groundskeeping. Angelica, on the other hand, seen the job simply as a means to an end. She was studying back home in Poland and the job enabled her to put some money by for her studies and her family back home. On the 26th of September, investigations were ongoing at the church as no one had seen Angelica since the 24th of September when she was seen in the grounds of the church itself. Pat McLaughlin, real name Peter Tobin, stated his concern to the interviewing police, mentioning it was unlike the girl. He noted he had seen her the evening of the 24th and the police noted that he appeared at this point to be the last person to have seen Angelica alive. By September 27, worry had reached fever pitch and Annette Kluck, Angelica's sister, publicly raised concerns that her sister had not been seen since. She had not been in contact with anyone to explain her absence and none of her bank accounts had been accessed. Interestingly, Pat McLaughlin was nowhere to be seen. He had not turned up for his regular handyman shifts at the church, but it went somewhat unnoticed given the more pressing issue of finding the missing Angelica. His absence became notable on September 28th when the police released his photograph on national television to let the public know they were looking to interview the man in question, Pat McLaughlin. Then, on September 29, the police made both a shocking discovery and delivered an equally shocking revelation to the public. They had discovered the dead body of Angelica Kluck underneath the floorboards of St. Patrick's Church and the man they were hunting was not Pat McLaughlin, it was a rapist named Peter Tobin, who had skipped bail in Paisley in 2005 related to historical sex charges in England, for which he had served 14 years. Angelica, the quiet and friendly cleaner of St. Patrick's and student back home, had been violently attacked prior to her death. 
Tobin had tied up Angelica while she was alive, then raped her. Amidst this, he had tortured and beat her, then stabbed her as many as 13 times. He then took her bound body and stuffed her into a subfloor hatch, which only he knew of. She was discovered with her hands bound and her mouth gagged. It later transpired that it was likely that Angelica was still alive at this point in her ordeal. Peter Tobin was tracked down in London on October 2, 2006, having been admitted to hospital with a non-existent illness under a fake name. He was recognised by hospital staff due to the images widely circulated on TV at the time. Police attempted to make the arrest, however, formally charging him was delayed until October 7 due to his supposed ill health. Once discharged, he was escorted to Scotland to await trial for the murder of Angelica. A jury of 15 of his peers took only four hours to convict him of Angelica's rape and murder at the High Court in Edinburgh in May of 2007. He was sentenced to 21 years. As he was escorted to the police van to begin his sentence, he lashed out at a journalist who had informed Tobin he was a quote, scummy bastard. One of the things which police noted with interest afterwards was that 60 was a strange age to begin committing such egregious acts of violence. They had pulled his file when they discovered he had skipped bail under his real name of Peter Tobin. He had served 14 years for imprisoning, sexually assaulting and attempting to murder two schoolgirls. In 1993, living in Havant on England's south coast, Tobin had gotten two schoolgirls incredibly drunk on strong cider and wine. They had turned up to his neighbour's house. However, when they were met with no answer, Tobin invited them in. After getting them incredibly drunk, he proceeded to sexually assault the girls. Once he had finished his sexual assault, he left the girls in a drunken stupor in his living room. He turned on his gas taps fully and locked his door as he headed out. He expected the girls to asphyxiate on the gas. Luckily, they survived. The survivors made a report to the police and then simultaneously, an acquaintance of Tobin went to the police. He noted in the aftermath that he had encountered Tobin Tobin seemed maddened, upset and distressed and mentioned that the police were looking for him. After the strange incident, Tobin made for Brighton train station and his acquaintance made for the police station. As a result of the report, Detective Chief Inspector Nick Imber made a statement to national newspapers indicating the search for Tobin was ongoing. Tobin was captured soon after his car was spotted in public and his face broadcast on the news as he was heading out to that religious retreat in Nottingham. At trial, he was sentenced to 14 years for the crimes. It seemed unlikely in light of this that Angelica was Peter Tobin's first successful attempt at murder. In the aftermath of this discovery, the police set up Task Force Anagram which had the sole purpose of unpacking Peter Tobin's life and discovering his crimes. One of the crimes he was suspected of was the likely murder of Vicky Hamilton, who had disappeared in 1981. Tobin had lived in the same town as Vicky, Bathgate, at the time of her disappearance. When he was brought in for questioning at Fraserburgh Police Station, he replied, quote, Sorry, I can't help you. Never met her. Never. The net was closing in, as police had discovered a bloody knife containing Vicky's DNA at Tobin's Edinburgh flat. By this time, the task force had discovered Peter Tobin's former residence at Irvine Drive in Margate, near Kent in England. They were certain that given some of the information they had received, there was something to be discovered at the location. 
ground-penetrating radar that was deployed signalled abnormalities too. As they began to dig underneath the patio at his former residence, a heavily anticipated shout went up. They had found a body. Only, it didn't match the description of Vicky. It did match the description of another girl who had been reported missing back in 1991, Dina McNichol. Dina was a fun-loving 18-year-old. She had been attending a music festival and had told friends she was going to hitchhike home. She was never heard from again. When the remains were discovered, pending testing, her father, Ian McNichol, said after talking about how he hoped the remains were that of his daughter to allow the family to finally grieve, quote, It's the worst thing I've ever had, the not knowing, because I've had it for years. The body was then quickly confirmed as that of Dina McNichol. Once his house and garden had been completely uprooted, the body of Vicky was also discovered. She had been stabbed to death and most likely raped. Most disturbingly, Vicky's body had been cut in two halves at the scene of the crime, then transported to Margate. Tobin had hidden the unmarked grave beneath the construction of a sandpit he had built for his children on the property. Sixteen years after both events, Peter Tobin's known murder count had increased by two. Tobin was sentenced to a further life imprisonment at the High Court in Dundee for Vicky Hamilton's murder. For Dina McNichol, Tobin again received another life sentence, this time at Chelmsford Crown Court. Two key areas began to interest Task Force Anagram when they considered Bible John and Peter Tobin. The first area was the discovery of the bloody knife which had been used in the murder of Vicky Hamilton in Tobin's Edinburgh flat and the discovery of several trinkets hidden within a wall cavity of the Margate home with no identifiable owner. They remembered from their training and their Glasgow knowledge that Bible John had taken the handbags of all three victims, albeit albeit disposing of one in the aftermath. Secondly, Peter Tobin looked a lot like the identified image which Jeannie Gowans had said would be sufficient to snare her sister's killer. Barring the fact his hair was more brown, he looked precisely how an aged version of the suspect would look. The news was littered in the days afterwards with stories from Tobin's ex-wives and the coincidences that came thick and fast between Tobin and Bible John. Tobin had been married three times, once to Margaret Mountney, once to Sylvia Jeffries and finally to Cathy Wilson. None lasted more than three years and all were marred by the same pattern of charm into violence into domestic torture. One of his ex-wives noted that he had initially been incredibly charming, then over time, the devil came out in him. After one argument, he decapitated her pet dog. In another, as she lay in bed, he stabbed her numerous times in her genitals. One factor which she often found to be an aggravator of Tobin's temper was her menstrual cycle. Whenever she was menstruating, she mentioned it was as if he could tell and he would become increasingly violent until it stopped. All three of Bible John's victims were menstruating at the time of their death. Police were keen to test Tobin's DNA against the recovered sample from Helen Puttock's dress. However, when Carol Weston, the forensic psychologist in charge, compared the DNA, it was not given as a match. It would later be found the sample was improperly stored and could no longer be considered to provide an adequate base against which to test. Now armed only with their burning curiosity, police interviewed Peter Tobin in the hopes that he would provide information on his criminal history and potential associations with Bible John. He steadfastly refused to assist any police investigation. He did, however, taunt a prison psychologist by stating that he had, quote, killed 49 people, 
now prove it. Before resuming his code of silence, from an official standpoint, this ended the formal investigation into the connection between the two men. However, from an unofficial perspective, it was just the beginning. David Wilson, a famed Scots criminologist, stakes his professional reputation on Peter Tobin being Bible John. Tobin can be conclusively placed in Glasgow in 1968, having been listed at an address in Shettleston at this juncture. However, during the murder of the second victim, it is likely that Tobin was in Brighton, having gotten married to Margaret on the 6th of August 1969. However, 460 miles is not an insurmountable distance and Tobin was known to frequent a variety of areas around the country. Tobin was also a staunch and practising Catholic, a position which he would later abuse to hide from justice and commit murder. Tobin regularly practised the use of false names. Names Peter Tobin went by in his working life, primarily to hide from his criminal past, were Peter Wilson, James Kelly, Pat McLaughlin, Peter Probin, and most interestingly, Paul Semple. The name Jeannie Gowans remembered was either Templeton or Sempleson. Given the level of information she had to take in and try to remember, it is not an incredible leap from Semple to Sempleson. Tobin was also arrested in Brighton in 1969, right around the time at which the murders finally stopped. Furthermore, STV, in their production, In Search of Bible John, had an age regression done on an image of Peter Tobin in his 60s to make him look as he would have in 1969. The artist was not informed of the purpose of the age regression. The resulting image can almost perfectly be overlaid with the Bible John identified. Tobin knowingly destroyed records and images of himself and Task Force Anagram were never able to procure a photograph of Tobin in his early 20s, as he would have been at the time of the Bible John murders. STV, however, were able to procure one image of Tobin in 1973. The image is grainy and has been poorly stored. Little can be gleaned except for one glaring dark mark on the page. Peter Tobin, in 1973, just like Bible John, was visibly missing a tooth. Tobin's offending in Glasgow during the time period can also be proven. A woman came forward in July 2010 stating that in 1968 Tobin had attacked her in a Glasgow tenement. Tobin, then 21, had met the woman on a night out on the town. He informed her he was called Jim McLaughlin, again a false name and offered her a drink. The survivor noted that she was certain he had spiked the drink and has no recollection of leaving the town centre, only coming around as she was being subjected to a sexual assault on the landing at the top of the tenement stairs. After a struggle, she managed to break free and escaped Tobin's clutches. She never came forward to police as she felt there was only a very remote chance that she would be believed had she went to the police at the time. There are nonetheless a few detractions from the theory of Peter Tobin as Bible John. Tobin is of average height and has brown, not blue eyes. He was also younger than the suspect, being only 21 at the time of the first murders. Given that two of the murders had taken place in the wake of an over 25s night at the Barrowland Ballroom, this may have unwittingly influenced witnesses' descriptions. Given there are no available images of Tobin within this time period, it is also incredibly difficult to know precisely what age he would have looked during the investigation. The STV regression image is one of the few clues that are available and offers a strong match to the known description of the suspect. A further difference is in the way the victims were treated before and after their murder. Tobin's known victims were all attacked with weaponry, mostly stabbed. They were then fully concealed 
as if he were ashamed of what he had done. The Bible John murder victims were displayed as evidence of his work and strangled, not stabbed. However, in his own offending, the two survivors of Tobin's attack in Havant, which was committed soon after the attacks against Vicky Hamilton and Dina McNichol, were left prominently displayed in his locked flat and he attempted the murder by gas exposure, showing that he is potentially within the unusual category of serial killers with a flexible MO. Former DSI of Strathclyde Police, David Swindle, made a public appeal in 2016 for Tobin to confess to any outstanding crimes against him, but Tobin was once again not forthcoming. Peter Tobin has been in ill health since 2016 when he suffered a stroke in his prison cell at Sauton Prison in Edinburgh, Scotland. He is now suffering from cancer and is expected to die within the year. He has still never answered the question whether he really is Bible John. Jeannie Gowans, now McLachlan, the sister of Helen Puttock, died on the 1st of July 2012, meaning the only person who can truly state for a fact they have seen Bible John face to face is now gone. Paul Carroll, the then 52 year old son of Jeannie, said that a few months prior to her death, she had told his daughter Debbie that Peter Tobin had killed her sister. He said that he had then asked her on her deathbed, to which she said, Yes, it was him. His daughter Debbie, however, rubbished his report and said that her grandmother had spoken previously of John McInnes, the suspect ruled out in 1996, to note that she didn't think it was him, but had never made any statement to her recollection about Peter Tobin. There exists only one loose end in the whole story, which could change the entire course of the investigation. Castle Milk John has never come forward. Castle Milk John existed. He may have neither been from Castle Milk, nor been John. However, that night he stared evil in the face and chose to stay quiet. In February of this year, it became 52 years since the murder of Patricia Docker, and it is over 50 years since the murders of Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock. Assuming Castle Milk John was in his mid-twenties at the time, he would now be approaching 80 years old. If he is dead, maybe he told someone on his deathbed of what he had seen and why he hid himself afterwards. If he is not, Castle Milk John, come forward. It is time for the last of the knowledge to be shared. The remaining families of Patricia, Jemima and Helen deserve justice. If you feel you have any information which may prove valuable to this case, you can phone the non-emergency number in Scotland on 101. Or, alternatively, you can report any knowledge anonymously to Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111 or via an online form.